So welcome back to the third leg of fossils. We're going to be looking at fossil preservation first and then we'll tie that in with types of fossils and then get into the heart and soul of fossils which is the reality that we have an incomplete fossil record and what that means to us in terms of the value of the fossils that we find in the field. So finding a specimen like this guy right here, that's Leonardo. So the guy that found Leonardo, he and his dig team, I went and did a dinosaur dig with him years back and uh, did it in the Judith River formation. So this one's found in a different formation, Hell Creek formation. And that's Cretaceous, the one I was digging in was actually uh, late Jurassic. So we were in the same basic vicinity as this guy right here. What makes him so remarkable is that basically his original self, minus being desiccated, which is dried, is intact. You can see skin. You can see texture. We can learn a lot from specimens that have been unaltered. So it gives us a glimpse back into the parts of an animal we usually don't get to see, whether it's vertebrate or invertebrate. It's rare in both circumstances to get unaltered preservation. So let's talk about what type of unaltered preservation is out there. Freeze-dried specimens like you see this baby woolly mammoth from Siberia just imagine what we could do with the information and the science when you've got color of fur, you've got blood, you've got muscles, you've got uh, characteristics that are usually not preserved in the fossil record because we're just left behind with bones. Now we've got the rest of the animal. So that opens the door for genetics, obviously. So you might be thinking, I wonder if we're ever going to have little woolly mammoths running around. Well, they're already in the process, they meaning scientists abroad, at trying to clone these things. So that's an ethical question that we'll save for later, but one that I want to kind of store in the back of your brain. Is it ethical to bring back an animal that's already been selected by nature to go extinct? So there's a lot of thoughts on that, and you may have your own philosophy and theory. So I would tell you right away that a fossil like this is like a grand slam, a big deal. It doesn't happen very often, but when it does, uh, soft tissue is available for us to study. So it's something extremely important. There's a site out in California called La Brea Tar Pits that I would highly advise you to visit if you're ever in the Hollywood area. Well, there's no Hollywood associated with it. It's right down the street. Uh, it's worth a day trip to get to visit and to see uh, remains of animals that have fallen into a tar pit and they're captured with their full remains as well. So that's another type of unaltered fossilization. Sometimes you can get shelly animals like a clam that will end up having their original mother a pearl aragonite layer, which is very rare that it hasn't been replaced or recrystallized or uh, changed from its original format. But sometimes that happens. Amber, like you see this bug right here, is the premise behind Jurassic Park and Jurassic World movies. So that little bug, chances are we're not gonna be able to extract any DNA, but there could be potentially something there. Nevertheless, these get uh, stuck into some tree resin, which will then get covered by new layers of tree sap or resin and get uh, embedded in rock layers. And it is a form of unaltered preservation. You won't find big animals in amber, but you can find smaller insects, sometimes uh, little reptiles that will get stuck there. Sometimes unaltered preservation can happen in a sense that we still have what's almost identical to what the animal was alive and it's starting to make that transition. We refer to that as a subfossil. These are organisms that are more than 10,000 years old but not been preserved by some form of altered preservation. The outer coatings might be in the case of this tusk right here of a mammoth. So you can see it's starting to oxidize here and uh, slightly be permineralized, but the inside is still a definitely original tusk material. 
So that is a, a possibility in some of our fossils that we find in shallow formations, meaning uh, formations close to the surface, and these animals just haven't been in the ground very long, are subfossils. They have not been altered. More commonly are altered fossilization processes. When a fossil is preserved this way, something about its original character has changed. Permineralization is the process by which the tissues of a biological animal, such as the bones of this phytosaur, this is a really important phytosaur jaw in terms of uh, research for a prior student of mine, uh, and this student discovered this at our second year that he went on field course, the second time that we dug at Tucumcari. And um, what's significant about this jaw is that it appears to be the second largest phytosaur ever found. The undergraduate research that he's done has demonstrated a model, in other words, a scale model, that we can actually compare other phytosaur skulls from around the world to determine an accurate size of the animal based on the mandible, which would be this joint right here. So permineralization, you would get groundwater that fills the pores of these bones and actually uh, the groundwater is full of minerals and it will fill those cavities, making the bone more dense than it was. Now don't get me wrong, it's the fragile bone. So um, it's been permineralized and permineralization is the most common way teeth and bones are preserved. So the bone uh, turns into solid rock and it can come from dissolved calcium carbonate, silica, whatever the groundwater is saturated with in terms of minerals. None of the original material is removed so that's why it's not replacement, but the pores and the canals where blood vessels or muscles or so forth used to be are filled with different minerals. Keep in mind, this is not a replacement at all. Very common for shelly types of animals in vertebrates is recrystallization. So here's a shell that has not been uh, altered at all. It's in its original format. This is one that has been recrystallized. This occurs when the shell is converted, the material that made the shell original, originally. This occurs when the shell that was made originally is uh, changed from its original less stable mineral state to a more stable mineral state, such as aragonite turning into calcite. Very common in, like I said, shelly animals. So the shape of the fossil is preserved. The texture will appear different and usually stronger than it was before uh, it had been recrystallized. So you know what it's like to pick up a shell likely from the beach. And it's very fragile, right? So imagine something's been recrystallized. It's a harder version of that, but it's in the same mineral family. So the chemical composition is still the same. It's just turned from a less stable, softer material to a more durable, recrystallized version of the same thing. When you get an altered fossil that has been uh, replaced, that's something completely different. So let's talk about dissolution and replacement. Dissolution will occur when water seeps through sediments filled with shelly material or bones and replaces the original material such as calcite, ar aragonite, phosphate with something completely new. That means that you're dissolving away the old stuff and putting something new in its place. I would use the example of you have to get a, uh, a tooth, a root canal, and you get a cap put on that's completely different. So I'm just imagine a gold cap going right here for me or somewhere in my mouth, and it would be completely different than what my tooth normally looked like. That's essentially what happens with this type of fossil preservation. So imagine that you go in to get a root canal and you need to get a cap put on your tooth, and you choose a new uh, caps, maybe even a different color tooth. Let's say you just decide to do zebra stripes, right? So I put a zebra stripe right here and it's a different composition from my tooth. That would be the equivalent of what replacement is. So this type of preservation definitely makes the fossil more durable. In many cases, it changes it into a, a metalish type material like 
pyrotized it. It makes it denser. Oftentimes it makes it darker. Not always, but many times it does. So replacement is the, uh, different from recrystallization because it literally has dissolved away the old stuff, the original stuff, replaced it with some kind of new mineral. So trace fossils are uh, something that we need to talk about as well. When you're looking at fossils, uh, trace fossils are preserved in the rock record from time to time, and their evidence of an ancient animal used to be in the neighborhood. So what do I mean by that? It's not the animal itself. So it's not a clam, it's not the shell, it's not the vertebrate jaw I showed you of the phytosaur, it's not a dinosaur tooth, but it's evidence of something like that being in the area because we find traces that the animal was there. In hunting today, uh, hunters are always looking for tracks of animals to try to locate where they are. So that's an example of a trace, a modern day trace. So let's give you a couple of examples and we'll show you a few of these. Cast and molds, uh, we'll get to in just a second. Tracks and trails are pretty obvious. Tracks are footprints while trails are where an animal drug itself and left a kind of a trail line behind them. Uh, burrows and borings. Burrows are where animals burrow in the mud and borings are circles that are left behind where something literally ate through something else that leaves a boring hole uh, behind, oftentimes found in shells. Gastroliths are stones that are eaten by animals, specifically uh, certain types of dinosaurs that were herbivores and birds, some of them today will eat stones to aid in digestion. Coprolites, like you see right here, are fossilized fecal remains. Very interesting, considering they come in lots of different flavors, kind of like Baskin Robbins. And so you can take a cross section, slice section, and actually analyze what the animal was eating when uh, this particular fecal matter was uh, left behind in the rock record. And then there's carbonized fossils. So let's take a look at a few. Carbonization is a type of fossil preservation that uh, we can see. And I'm going to put this one under the trace fossil. That's a little bit on the fence because some paleontologists would say, well, no, carbonized fossils are body fossils. Here's why I'm going to put them under trace because carbonized fossils, there used to be a fish here, but they're no bones. They're just volatile organic carbon film. So if you want to call that part of the original animal, to me it's not enough to call it a body fossil. And so that's why I'm going to call this a trace fossil. Technically this is organic material that when the animal decayed it left this film. And so that argument, I could understand why you might think that it could be a body fossil. But really, I think you would agree that it's probably more trace than it is body. So understand there are no bones in that fish, none. There's just a carbon film where it got buried. Finding carbonization right away tells you a clue about the environment. It'd be kind of like swampy or quick burial in a situation where an animal gets kind of locked in anoxic conditions and uh, it just kind of gets buried in a mud layer so it can decay in that mud layer. Oftentimes, small fish, uh, plants most commonly can be preserved this way. So these are common types of preservation. Cast and molds. These tend to be a problem for people to understand. And uh, if you've taken physical, then you already have this information. But just to reiterate, these are not body fossils. They're trace fossils. Obviously, they look just like the animal. What they're missing is the actual body piece. In this case, the shell that would go with the ammonite. So the shell got squashed into this piece of limestone, pressed in there, and likely what happened is the shell, the chambers of it, filled up with sediment, which is going to be this part right here. So a term that's used in many textbooks is internal and external molds. To make it more clear, this would be uh, the internal mold known as a cast. So we're going to use the appropriate term cast in here. And this would be the external mold, meaning the outside of the animal got squashed in the mud and left behind an impression. So this would be the external mold. So if you ever read that somewhere, you'll know where the terms internal and external mold came from. 
But a cast is a three-dimensional piece that represents where the inside of the cavity of that animal got filled with sediment, and the mold represents the impression left behind by that fossil. Neither one of them are body. They're both trace, but there used to be a body there. So sometimes we find extraordinary fossil preservation, something that is worthy of making the world record book of fossil localities. These are called loggerstatins. So um, these particular sites are so impressive. Literally, the German word means mother load. Sounds pretty neat, doesn't it? These are deposits of fossils, usually communities of fossils, that are so extraordinary, they sometimes often uh, will include soft body parts. Um, maybe we don't have the actual remains of the soft body, but we have impressions or, or cast of them. But these are things that tell a much broader story, more specific story, uh, than just a handful of fossils here or there. This site would be one of the top 10 of the world, probably considered the most significant geologic find in the history of paleontology. That's the Burgess Shale outcrop in British Columbia, which we'll talk more about when we get to the Middle Cambrian. So if we can find one of these Lagerstatten sites, um, they are truly a record maker because they can give us very close glimpse into habitat conditions and even organisms we don't find in the fossil record normally, which I'll get to in just a minute. That brings me to understanding some basic terminology of fossils called fossil assemblages. This gives students a lot of issues in physical, so I'm going to take extra time to talk about it in historical so it's clear because we'll refer to fossil assemblages all semester when we're talking about fossils throughout the geologic time scale. A death assemblage, what is that? Well, all animals are going to die, right? So a death assemblage means the animal dies, and typically the remains of the animal are uh, dispersed. They are moved away from the site and point where that animal was last standing living or crawling or resting at the bottom of the ocean. Okay, so whatever type of animal it might be. In other words, their last living spot on Earth, they're moved from that location. In addition, in um, almost a majority of the cases, the bones, the uh, shells, whatever it might be, are separated. In other words, they're not articulated. Articulated means the bones are still together or the shells are still together. Uh, and so when they've been dispersed, they tend to get carried by river currents, sometimes by wind, very doubtful by wind, but definitely water can move them. So if you could imagine, let's just say a dead crocodile is floating down a river and it smashes into a point bar or to a cut bank, it's going to shatter into multiple pieces. So now you got a drumstick where a femur is and some animal comes and eats that for lunch and carries that to the den to feed their babies. Uh, you're probably not going to have a complete specimen anymore because you just had a scavenger take some of that out of the neighborhood. So fossil assemblages that are death are usually incomplete. That doesn't mean they're not valuable. They certainly are. But these are much more common than living assemblages of fossils. So death assemblages basically mean that you've got a group of fossils or a fossil that is out of place from its original location where it died. It's been transported somewhere else. Now living assemblages are a completely different ballgame. This is remarkable to find one of these where an animal actually dies, whether it's a shell, it's a dinosaur, it's a reptile, in this case a Colombian mammoth at the Waco Mammoth site, but they die where they were last living. Oftentimes they're very well articulated, maybe not completely, but they're still pretty much together. In some cases they've had very minimal scavenging. So that is a remarkably better picture for a paleontologist to look at other clues like habitat, maybe try to infer some behavior conditions from the animals based on how they were buried. At the Waco Mammoth site, this is certainly the case because a number of the mammoths were found standing up outside the in-situ shelter. 
and they were in a formation of a, a semicircle around the young, indicating a protective defensive uh, behavior pattern. So uh, lots can be inferred. It may not be 100% correct, and that's why more discoveries of the same type are so valuable to compare and contrast to try to conclude good scientific uh, observations between each location. Living assemblages are rare, but when we do find them, they're an extraordinary help for moving forward in paleontology. So here we are at the magic million dollar question about fossils. How good is our fossil record? I'll let you be the judge of that after you hear this. We have a, an incomplete record at best, but how incomplete is incomplete? We got about 1.5 million described species from both fossil and living uh, organisms and potentially up to 4.5 million. So when you look at what's alive today, there are 250,000 described species of plants and animal presently known, which means that only 5% of the overall animals ever to live on Earth are alive today. About 1.5 million described species are insects, FYI, and they're poorly preserved. So here is a fossil, uh, and it is some portion of a phytosaur that we found in Tucumcari. And we're looking at this bone, it's very incomplete, so a lot of our fossil record ends up looking like this, especially in the vertebrate side. Well, the invertebrate side has a lot richer rock record, and one of the reasons is, is they mostly live in water, except for insects that are airborne. You know, insects kind of figured out how to live on water, on land, and also in the air. But when you look at uh, the fossil record in terms of invertebrates, most of the ones that are preserved are ones that live in water. So water tends to bury organisms pretty fast. There are nine phyla of invertebrates, which have much better preservation than what you just saw of insects and certainly of vertebrates. Um, we're going to be looking at all of these throughout the semester. Uh, Archaeocyathads are these guys right here. They'll come about very early on in our Paleozoic. Peripheral are sponges, cnidarians, or things like corals. Uh, bryozoans are uh, sea mosses. Brachiopods look like clams, but they're different. Mollusks include a number of classes, which we'll look at, like gastropods, cephalopods, bivalves, pelecipods. Echinoderms are things like uh, things like um, uh, crinoids, blastoids, uh, starfish. A number of things that may surprise you, sand dollars. Arthropods are all of your crawly things that aren't insects. So we have a pretty rich fossil record of these guys. And these groups, there are about 150,000 living species minus the insects that are uh, we mentioned earlier and about 180,000 fossil species. It kind of puts a question mark there, doesn't it? So approximately 2.3% to 13.6%, depending on which experts' uh, literature you read, is from all of these nine invertebrate phyla have been fossilized. All right, so let's just take somewhere in the middle. How about a nice six and a half percent? Just somewhere in the middle of those two numbers. If that's the case, wow. I mean, that means from any either case, if we're looking at the extreme middle or uh, stream high, it doesn't matter, we have between 85% and 97% of all living organisms that were invertebrates that are not preserved in the rock record. And keep in mind, they're the easiest ones to preserve. So food for thought, why does that happen? Could be because of depositional environments like a river where they get crushed, they get mushed. Could be in the ocean where pressure uh, breaks up those shells. It could be from scavenging. There's just a long laundry list of what could cause this to occur. With such an incomplete fossil record, you can imagine in the invertebrate category how much more slim the chance would be for a vertebrate to get buried, much less be a living fossil assemblage. So the quality of the rock record sometimes is good. 
For example, this is the Burpee Museum of Natural History's Burpee Hanksville site in Hanksville, Utah, which we go to on our field course in Dinosaur Dig, and these students have been digging these bones out. This is not the norm. This is a very rare circumstance. If we want to conduct a large-scale uh, study of evolutionary trends, we must concentrate on bigger classifications, higher classifications of uh, taxonomy, which means how animals are classed, meaning kingdom, phylum, classes, and orders, but not try to get down the species most of the time. And you can become an expert real quick in one area, one animal type, if you get down into species. And then it gets really tricky on is it that species or something else. Just the smallest morphological change in a fossil, like in a bone, could change the type of phytosaur that it could be. The good news is that many formations have excellent preservations of very specific uh, groups of animals because of some unique circumstance by which they were buried. So you kind of got both sides. We got this incomplete fossil record, but occasionally we get a real treat and we get a really great show to look at with fossils. Kind of like our movie theaters, right? You get a really good show and you're like, wow, I'm glad I went and saw it. Well, that's kind of how fossils are. You never know what you're going to get when you get out there. So let's see if you can tell a story here. First of all, is this a vertebrate or an invertebrate? Look at the rock. Can you determine potentially what type of rock this would be and what kind of environment must have created it? So you're kind of looking at a silt zone and you're looking at uh, silty sands. And so if that's the case, I bet we're looking at some kind of river deposit. And I know it is because I've been there. So I think you probably chose vertebrate, and you're right. This is actually binac right here, which is a glue for bones and fossils. And we've glued this uh, fossil that we found right here, which ended up being part of a uh, likely a um, vertebrae. So we got to know more about it. You have to have an expert that can recognize the fossil. By itself, it doesn't tell us a whole bunch, but considering the whole area that we're digging in is full of the same types of animals, it gives us a better glimpse into what's going on. You can see the challenges of getting a fossil out like that. It's very fragile. Um, it's been banged around, so oftentimes you're missing parts of them. It's just a typical story of most fossils that you find, certainly with vertebrates. You look at this story, it tells a completely different thing, doesn't it? This is Dinosaur National Monument in Utah. Uh, very incredible rock formation called the Morrison Formation from the Late Jurassic. Uh, the Late Jurassic is full of giant dinosaurs, the biggest dinosaurs that ever roamed the planet in terms of herbivore-type dinosaurs. I can see articulated bones here. You can see clusters of bones indicating that these animals likely died as groups. There's more than one animal in uh, Dinosaur National Monument in this in situ building. So it's kind of like the mammoth site. It is a very rare set of circumstances. Hopefully after you've learned a little bit about fossils, uh, from a historical point of view, you have a different lens. Remember that word lens? I was talking about a different perception than what you did before you started this. So more to come. We'll be visiting fossils a lot throughout the semester, and I will see you at the next lecture. Bye.